Miss for Junior Church may be excused. I'd like you to turn to Psalm chapter 90, please, in your Bibles. If there were ever was a sermon that I want you to listen to, it would be this sermon this morning. But I will tell you that next Sunday, too. And the Sunday afterwards as well. You know, we start to take and develop messages. And one day, my secretary came into our office and uh, I started to tell her my dream, not literal dream. My vision, not literal vision. My concept of what I'm going to do today. It is with fear and trembling that I'm going to preach the message the way I'm going to preach it. Because I'm going to, in this message, pretend I am God. Not intended to be sacrilegious or disrespectful to my God. But I trust that it will give you an idea of God from the Word of God, through the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Got a couple of little boys here, and they are playing and pretending to be Spider-Man and Captain America. And uh, these two boys are like me when I was young, only I played Cowboys and Indians gotcha and we used to run and gun we used to ride our horses do you ever ride a horse you know that's the way you do it of course we were the lone ranger and tonto and all of those pretend characters and cartoons that we saw in comic strips and i used to enjoy that part of my life it would take me to a different world shooting, yelling, screaming, I shot you! You didn't die! Of course, we have lasers today, lights that, uh, I guess you got me, a little bit higher tech than we did. No bullets, cap guns maybe, at the most. We would hide behind barns and cars and trucks and houses and in the grass, wherever we could get our bodies hidden from the other person. And this morning, we probably give you a better sequence of, at least closer to your world, the holodome or holodeck in Star Trek. A make-believe world that you could enter and go into and be back in 1920 or 1800s, you know. Captain Picard and those characters of Star Trek would take you to. I used to love that. Sci-fi sci was my love when I was younger. A world of make-believe. A world that didn't exist. My presentation this morning is no disrespect, disrespect of our great and awesome God. We can never play God, we can pretend to be God, but you know what, there are many people that are God because Jesus said, as the Old Testament said, you are gods, and that's right. Many people are their own gods. They worship themselves. They don't worship the true and living God as we do. We live in a world of pretending. I want you to come along with me this morning I want you to see the past, the future, through a Bible character. Pastor Floyd does it so well. I will give it my best shot for his glory. This is my focus this morning. 
of taking the liberty to communicate two facts about our awesome and exalted God through his word in drama. And yes, I'm going to act. So here we go. The first fact that I want to talk about before I do the drama <coughs> is to help you to understand that God knows everything in advance. Everything in advance. I'm going to take you on two passages of scripture. One is in Psalm 90 where I've asked you to turn. And it says here, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Look at verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth and ever were you formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From eternity past to eternity future, you are God. Understand that. You and I are living in a speck of time. If you live to be 100 years old, you will live in a speck of time. The Bible says just this one verse that our God is from everlasting to everlasting. Would you come with me if you could, if I could, even go back through the door into the back uh, lawn area beyond that and keep walking in the direction of north and keep walking and walking and walking and that would be eternity past and I would never quit stopping in that walk that journey I would walk forever and never get to the end of eternity past my mind boggles and just as perplexed when I think about that. And think about this. Way back there, someplace in eternity past, God was there. And it doesn't matter how far back I go in eternity past, He's been there and He's there no matter how far back I go in the past. But when there's eternity, there's no time. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Verse 3. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. Hmm. Look at, your, look at your hands. One day they will be dust. One day they will be eaten up by maggots, maybe, burned in the fire. I'm not sure. That's all we are. Dust. Return, O children of man. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight, God, are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. Ask you a question, how fast did last week go? Huh? Poof! Before you know it, I'm going to be preaching my next sermon, and you're going to be sitting right there. It's going to be a short moment of time. Verse 5. You sweep the people away as with a flood, and they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. Look at your lawns. They're starting to sprout. We saw some flowers coming up in someone's garden yesterday. Verse 6 says, in the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades 
and withers. That's how fast grass grows and fades away. Watch it this summer. Verse 7. For we brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. Why is God angry? Why is he uh, in wrath in his heart? Verse 8. You have set our iniquities before you. You've set our secret sins in the light of your presence. So when the light of our presence comes, it reveals how sinful we are. That's why he's angry. That's why one day he's going to pour out his wrath upon this entire world. Verse 9. For all of our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our ears to an end like a sigh. One day you may be in your hospital bed and you will be too weak to get out of the bed and you will breathe your last breath. And there will not be another breath. It's all done. Man's days are so short. Verse 10. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. I've passed the 70 mark. I'm stretching out for 80. Some of you are stretching for 100. Bless your hearts. Verse 10 says, yet their span is but toil and trouble. Notice what it says. All there is left after you get done with 80, 90, 100 years is toil and trouble. So true is it not. Verse 10 ends up, they are soon gone. What's they? Our days. Our days are soon gone and we fly away. Hello? You fly away? Yeah. Your soul and spirit are going to come out of you. Your body is going to cease to function and you are going to fly away. The angels are going to take your soul and spirit if you're a Christian and you're going to go to heaven in a moment of time. And if you're not a Christian, the angel is going to take your soul and spirit and it's going to bring it to Hades. Verse 11. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? I want you to get a little glimpse of this verse. Please don't miss it. Verse 11. Here it comes. Who considers? Who's thinking about it? Have you ever sat down and thought about this? What? You've sat and thought about the power of God's anger. Have you ever thought about that? Say, I'm a Christian. I don't need to think about the anger of God. Oh, you better think about it. And you need to think about God's wrath. You say, why? Because God is going to justly, fairly judge you at the judgment seat of Christ if you're a Christian. But look at this. This is, a, this is an important thing, okay? Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath? Next two words in my version. According to the fear of you, God. We need to fear God. We need to respect Him. We need to put God way up in the air and acknowledge Him and worship Him and exalt Him and give Him glory and honor and praise. That's when we start to consider God according to the fear and respect that we have inside of us. 
You know what happens to most of us? We sit down and we contemplate God and we're just thinking, oh, he's such a wonderful God. He is filled with glory and honor and love and worship him. Oh, I just love him. He's so good to me. But understand that God is specific and he's very detailed about every aspect of your life. And if there's any hypocrisy in you or me, he knows it. And he will explore it and expound it when you come to judgment. Don't play and pretend with God. He knows you inside and out. You can fake me, you can fake everybody else in this world, but you won't fake God. And you need and you should have the fear of God inside of your heart. And if you don't, you're in trouble. Because this is what it's talking about here. According to the fear that is in you about him, about God. If God were to reveal himself instantaneously to us, you, if you didn't fall flat on your face before him, I would pity you. Because our God is so majestic, so powerful. ends up here in verse 12. So God, because of the fear, so God, because I have considered the power of your wrath and anger, verse 12, so teach us to number our days. Teach us, Father, to take every second, every minute, every hour of time and let me worship you and praise you and live for you. I want you to become number one in my life. If that's not in your life right now, friend, I feel sorry for you. I feel pity for you. I feel compassion for you. Because if Jesus Christ is not number one in your life, you are in trouble. You're wasting your time. You're doing things you ought not to be doing. You're spending your time doing other things that you should not be doing, and you should be reading the Word and growing in Him. You need to be putting Him number one in your life all the time, every day, all the time. Lord, because of you and your wrath and your anger, teach me to number my hours and days and minutes and seconds. My agenda should be filled with you Filled with what you want for me, not what I want. Not my pleasures, not my vacations, not my pleasant times. I should be filled with what you want me to do. And if I'm not doing that, I'm living for myself and it's selfish. And you know what you're going to get at the end of life as a Christian? Nothing. Ashes. Verse 14, 13, 12 rather. So teach me. To number our days. Why? That we may get a life and a heart of wisdom. What I did last week, what I did last month, last year, I need to learn from that in order to do better tomorrow. If I don't learn from yesterday of how to live it out better today, I've missed the point to live that day. You understand what I'm saying? Huh? Either you do or you don't. I'm going to tell you how many lessons I've learned in each day that I live. I learn things. Oh, man, I should have done it differently. If you could ever do it over again, I would do it differently, better than I did it before. You live today to learn how to live better tomorrow. The mistakes you made today or yesterday should be improved and eliminated so that you might do it not again. This is serious business living out this life. You know, God didn't give you 70 or 80 years of life just to twiddle your thumbs. He didn't give you this life just to go out and have parties. Didn't give you this life to waste it away playing video games or television or do anything else. 
But you can do it. You're welcome to it. You have the free will to do it if you so choose. But if you really get a a vision, an idea, a thought about who God is and what He's really given it to you to do in your life, then you're not going to waste it. But you can, if you want. <sighs> Makes me so sad to watch Christians waste year after year after year. Oh, they come to church on Sunday. They read their Bibles once in a while. They pray a lot, especially when they're in crisis. But that's not the Christian life. Jesus came that we might have life and might have it what? More abundantly. Super abundantly. Are you living that kind of a life? Do you know that your life is with the agenda God has planned out for you? Or are you just saying, eh, I'll catch you later and going and doing your own thing? Now you'll have to answer for that. Psalm 139, please. I better get moving because I know I'm going to get lost in my drama. Psalm 139. God's omniscience. God knows everything. Okay? That's what that big word, omniscience, means. Verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You know, it's nice. I can see you. You're all seated, seated here in this auditorium. I can see you. God can see you. No difference. But what God has an advantage with me, over me, is that he can hear your thoughts right now. He knows what you're thinking. I can't. But that's the difference between man and God. Verse 2. You know when I sit down, when I rise up, but you discern my thoughts from afar. Verse 3. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Ooh. Ooh, that's, that's squirmy. He's acquainted with all your ways, your habits the way you do it, when you do it, how you do it, what's your attitude. Ha <laughs> ha! Sees it all. Verse 4. Even before a word is on your tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You knew what I was going to say. Hello? He knew I was going to say hello. Before I said Hello? God knows everything about you. Notice verse 5. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Wow. God is protecting me. God is watching over us. God is watching and caring for us all the time. Verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Hello? <laughs> I cannot get that high in my thought realm. I think I'm a pretty smart guy. Oh, I probably say at least in the 25 percentile, you know. But, but God's knowledge and his omniscience is supremely beyond this world. And I hope you realize that. I remember one small thing from my confirmation class I don't remember very much. I remember the book I had, and I had 121 questions I had to learn the answers from. And really what it was, sad to say, you parroted the answer. Whoopee. One plus one equals what? All right, you can say it better than that. Two plus two equals? See, it's because you parrot. You've been taught that's the way you do it. And that's the way we learn. And that's okay. That's fine. But what happens in memorization, it should get here in the heart. And that's what happens and missed in churches, missed in confirmation. But anyway, this one thought 
the pastor said to us, God knows everything you're going to do before you do it. And I sat there and I pondered it. I went home after confirmation class that day and I was walking over the hill in the backyard of our house. And as I was walking up that hill, I was pondering about that thought. He knows everything before I do it. And so what I did as a 16-year-old boy, I went, did you know that, God? I talked to him. And I, I made some other faces. And uh, That was my silly way of saying, you didn't know that, did you? But he knew that. You know, we think human. We don't think deity. I was a fool when I did all of that. And sometimes we play the fool in life. I want you to know that the decisions of God that we're going to talk about this morning are not based on his foreknowledge. We're going to talk about eternity past. Okay? We're going to talk about a God who lived in eternity past. And we're going to find out that God is going to make decisions before time began. I believe that time began for human beings is 6,000 B.C. 6,000 B.C. That is when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 6,000 B.C. Not billions and billions of years, okay? Not, not at all an evolutionist. I'm a creationist, okay? Keep that in mind. Now, in eternity past over here, he knows everything. But his decisions back here are not because, oh, I know that, oh, I know that, I know that. Oh, I'm going to go decide that now. So I want you to understand Deuteronomy 7 and 8. Chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. It was not because that you were more in number than any other people. He's talking about Jews. That the Lord set his life or love upon you and chose you for you are the fewest of all peoples. So God didn't look down the road and say, oh, the Jews are small people, but I'm going to choose them anyway. God is saying back here, I made a decision to choose the Jews. But when I get over here, I'm going to choose the Jews, not because they're a great, big, strong people and they're going to conquer the world. In fact, they're the fewest of people. And then God says in verse 8, But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then he talks about bringing them out of Egypt. When God was existing in eternity past, God made decisions, as you're going to see this morning. And he's going to make decisions because God needs to make decisions and not because of things that happen down the road here. I hope to solidify that this morning. So that's my premise in regards to this whole matter of decisions of God. They are not based on his foreknowledge, but they're based upon his sovereignty. His sovereignty. What is sovereignty? I can do what I want to do. 
If I own a company, I can do what I want to do. And if I feel like it, I can burn my house down. I can burn my business down. I can do whatever I want because I'm sovereign. I own it. It's mine. Better make sure you've paid off the building. Hmm? The point is that it's mine. And, and God owns the world. He can do what He wants with the world. In fact, God owns you. Whether or not you like it, whether or not you understand it, God owns the world. He owns you and me. And He can do what He wants with us. Listen to what John 15, 16 says. And he's speaking to his disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. God didn't say, well, I, I'm going to look down the path here and, and, and see where the disciples are fitting in. And, and, and oh, yeah, there, there they are. And, and because they're going to choose me, I think I'll choose them back here. No, no, no. God doesn't work that way. God is sovereign. God made some clear choices, as you're going to see back here. And many of his decisions were made before creation, before this point in time, before Genesis 1-1. Okay? Understand that before we get to the drama. Ephesians 1-4 says, Even as he chose us as individual believers in Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, before Genesis 1-1, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Well, have you found it to be true that God knows everything, everything in advance? Do you agree that the fact that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-seeing, and He knows even before we think, say, or do it. Think about it. Ponder it. Here we go. Number two. You're in Psalm 139, I hope. We're going to stay there. Second fact about God. God planned many major events before Genesis 1-1. Many major events before Genesis 1 1. Here are some plans, events in your life, every one of you sitting here, that God has planned before the beginning of time. Number one, that two or three planned events about God, about you, are realities. Number one, your conception. God planned your mother to conceive you before time. Look what it says in Psalm 139 real quickly, starting with verse 13. For you formed my inward parts, you knitted together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book they were written, every one of them, the days they were formed uh, for me, when as yet there was none of them. Notice verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them. When did he do that? Before the world began. Hmm? He didn't wait till 1944 and said, oh, we're going to have a little boy. His name is going to be Leslie Tackinen, and he's going to be born in Munising, Michigan to 
Laura Ludwa Takanin. Hmm? No, 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 no. Did it before the world began. The days were written down for me. And how many days I'm going to live, by the way, which reminds me, your death has also been appointed by God. Hebrews 9.27, there's going to be the appointment with death and the appointment with judgment. But your death is appointed already. Although, I, you need to understand, you can die before God's timing. We call it suicide. Hmm? You can commit suicide and choose to die before God desired for you to die. But you're going to die either way. So I think your appointment of conception and your appointment of death are already appointed. And if you're saved, you're appointed to have salvation. Ephesians 1, 4, we've already talked about. God does not plan your free will. What does that mean? You can do whatever you want. You can go to Italy and you can blow up the Tower of Pisa if you want. You can get up tomorrow morning and get your gun and go to the First National Bank and try to rob it if you want. See, you have free will. I have free will. I can do whatever I want. Mankind makes choices. The problem with Romans chapter 3, if there's a problem, it is a problem, that we choose the wrong things in life, and so does mankind. That's why mankind as a whole are probably going to go end up in hell. Why? Because they're making wrong choices. They free choice, make those choices themselves. And they choose to sin against God and to slap him in the face. We make choices every day of our lives. Joshua gave the people of Israel a choice. He says, you choose this day which whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord in my house. They can do whatever they want in their houses. And you can do it too, by the way. You can do whatever you want in your house. You have to choose. But as for tacking in a household here, living at 2611 South 117th Street, our house is going to serve the Lord. You have to make a choice in your lives, each one of us. It's called free will. And we all choose. God planned important events of history. Acts chapter 2, verse 23, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified him, you Jews. It was your free will. You killed by the hand of lawless men, Pilate and all the soldiers. You killed Jesus, the Son of God, delivered him up. But listen. God planned it before the foundation of the world. God planned it definitely that it would happen down in history. And it did. Acts 2.23. Acts 13, verses 36 and 37. For David, after he had served the purpose of God. Notice, David lived a life that was purposed by God. That David, when he lives in history, that God had a purpose for him. Do you realize that God has a purpose for you? My question is, are you living out your purpose or are you living out God's purpose? You see, it's one or the other. And David fell asleep and he's laid with his fathers and he saw corruption. But he, Jesus Christ, whom God raised up did not see corruption. You see, God predetermined the plan that not only would Jesus die on a cross, but that he would be resurrected from the grave. Acts 13, verses 36, 37. Here's some other acts and other passages you can look up later on. I've got to get moving. I know I do. Let's 
Lastly, before I get on with my actions, God planned the dispensations. God planned specific periods of time with specific reasons, and I'm going to show them to you, and I will explain them in coming sermons. God has control. Look what it says here, Acts 1-7. Because they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? And he said to his disciples, it is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed. The Father has fixed by his own authority. God's sovereignty chooses when he's going to take in history and establish the nation of Israel down the road. And there's nobody. There's nothing. There's no power. There's no devil. There's no power that's going to be able to stop it. Do you understand? When the rapture comes, it's because God is in control and he's going to take us out of this world. You understand, when he comes again, the second coming, he's going to come because he has set up the parameters of that. You need to understand that our God is in control of what's happening in this world, and it is so far that only he allows man to go. It's within his time frame, and it's going to happen in his way. Nothing else. Because he is in control. And get this one. God was not and God is not surprised at any moment of time. Never. Never. God doesn't say, oh, look what Les and I did. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Look at that guy. Never surprised. No matter what you do. And finally, God is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and he is the end. And now, the moment you've been all waiting for, me to turn into God. Just a moment. Hello, I'm God. And I'm Jesus. And I'm the Holy Spirit. I look like God the Father, don't I? And I look like Jesus, right? Well, it's because God is one. And I happen to be a theophany. A theophany is looking like human beings. Pastor Les right now is representing God. At this very moment, I am the Holy Spirit. And so you can see, as Jesus is going to speak, I'm Jesus now. When I get into this position, I'm Jesus. Holy Spirit, what do you think about the acting of Pastor Les that he's doing right now? He's not much of an actor. Plas Pastor Floyd would do a whole lot better. But he's working downstairs right now. What do you think, Father? He is one stressed out preacher boy. He needs a script. Can't remember what comes next. Just human. He's probably going to miss a line or two or a word or two. What do you think, Holy Spirit? By the time he's all done, he's going to be exhausted. He is creative. And this switching character as he walks and talks, pretending to be us, lots of pressure, man. You may hear Pastor Lay say, guys or man. That's because we're all males. I don't know if you know that, but the Bible says that we are male gender. 
no other gender will do. All three of us are male genders. Pastor Les is male gender, bless his heart. But that's what we're doing this morning is to present that. Jesus, people have three important questions. I'm going to tell you what they are. How did God become God before time? How did God become God before time? Question two. What was God going to do for billions of years before Genesis 1-1? So what did God do billions and billions of years back there before Genesis 1-1? And question number three. How did the three persons of the Godhead decide who was who? Well, Jesus, what are, the, what are the answers to those questions? The Word of God is the answer. The th secret things belong to God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do the words of this law. In essence, it's none of our business. It's none of man's business. Father, would you come down and let's begin telling the story about the planning of the beginning of time? Oh, come on, guys. We're going to tell the story. Start out. I will be the architect in this plan. I will be the one who will speak the words, since I'm the word of life, I will speak the words of creation. And I, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to take and, and move and work and put things together. Whatever you say, Jesus, I will take and I will put together and create it. So shortly after we create the universe, we're going to find the angels falling into sin. And so the architect, creation of the universe. Angels fell into sin. Did that surprise you, Jesus? Holy Spirit, did, did that surprise you that they're going to fall into sin? <laughs> Not at all. You and I know that we knew it before the beginning of time. And here we are before the beginning of time, knowing that they're going to fall into sin. Well, I think we have to do something at this point in time. We have to create hell the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I agree with you, Holy Spirit. Do you see what's happening now? Do you see that Adam and Eve are going to fall into sin? <laughs> Not surprising us, but it's reality. We, we need to have a solution to the problem. Because you already told them that in the day that they shall sin, they will die. And they're going to die. 
And if they don't die without having their sins taken away, they will go to the same place that the devil's going. I, I want you to know that I'm willing to go to earth and to become a sacrifice for those people. Not only for Adam and Eve, but for all the people that will be born in the future, I am willing to go and die in their place. And Jesus, I will send you into the world. The Heavenly Father will send his Son into the world to die for the sins of the world. <laughs> that is amazing. And that's wonderful. And I will be the one that will come along and I will speak to people's hearts and, 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 and we really need to find and select those that are going to accept Christ and believe in God properly. Otherwise, all of mankind is going to go to the place we prepared for the devil and his angels. You are so right. We have to do something. Let's select those by our wisdom of those that would be saved so that we might be able to save them from their sins. I think you're right. So let's do that right now. Well, we've got that all done. What's next, Heavenly Father? Well, I've got all the architectural plans made, and I've got all the things that we think we need to plan for the future right here in my pocket. And so we're going to go and uh, start the whole process. Okay, guys? So the creation of the world and the universe starts us out in 6,000 B.C., right? The angels are going to fall, and they're going to sin, and one-third of the angels are going to fall with them. And we've already prepared hell over there. And mankind... He's going to sin. And Jesus, you're going to go and die for those sins. And Holy Spirit, you're going to be working with people in their hearts concerning that. And we will call this dispensation the dispensation of promises. Because the first promise made is in Genesis 3.15 where God is going to crush the head of the serpent and the dispensation of promises will begin at this point. And then what happens? There's going to be great wickedness. The world has not seen the wickedness that this particular time is going to present. And we're going to have to do something about it. And in about 4,000 B.C., we're going to be calling a man by the name of Noah. And we're going to take that Noah and have him make a big ship. And we're going to take him and have him save eight people. And the rest of the world will be lost. And so after the flood, those eight people will re repopulate the world. And that one will happen. The people are going to become wicked all over again. In fact, they will want not to obey the word of God and they are going to scatter themselves. No, they're going to take and they're trying to build this big tower called the Tower of Babel. And so what we need to do, guys, is to go down there and confuse their languages. We need to go down and make them talk differently to each other so they will spread throughout the entire world the Tower of Babel. And then, oh, I'm sorry, ahead of myself. Got to go back to my script. 
2000 BC, Abraham is called. And we're going to give him a promise of Israel and what's going to happen there and how that the people are going to come out of his seed, Isaac and Jacob, and the patriarchs are going to journey. And they're going to go and they're eventually going to end up in, is, uh, in Egypt where they're going to be there for 400 long years. And they will suffer. They will go through a lot of pain. But I will call a man by the name of Moses. And Moses is going to come along. He's going to take them out of that particular place of Egypt. And then to Mount Sinai where the law will be given. And the dispensation of law begins in Exodus chapters 19 and 20. And as a result of it, it is the beginning when he starts to work with Israel. They get to Mount Sinai and then 40 years of wandering is going to come about. They're going to wander throughout the land for 40 years because of unbelief. And as a result of it, they're going to eventually crucify Jesus Christ. Take him and put him on the cross. They're going to get into Canaan there are going to be years of judges. There's going to be years of kings. There's going to be nations that are going to come out of them, Israel and Judah. And I'm going fast because my time is running. In 722 B.C., they're going to have an exile to Israel, to Assyria, 586 of Judah to Babylon. Then the exiles return back to Israel again in Jerusalem. 400 silent years will come. In 4 BC, Jesus will be born, the Messiah of the Jewish people. And he will come into this world and he will be crucified by his own people and the Roman soldiers. And then afterwards, the Jews will reject Jesus as Messiah. And in 31 AD will be the dispensation of grace where the apostle Paul is going to be raised up by God, given a purpose to go and reach out to the Gentiles. I want you to understand that these are the four particulars that we have in relationship to what God is going to do. And of course, the fourth one will be the kingdom. The kingdom will be established, and we need to understand from the dispensation of grace will be the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. The great tribulation will come. The second coming of Christ will come, and then the kingdom will start. And the kingdom begins the beginning of that 1,000 years in which this world is going to have peace. It's at the end of that 1,000 years that there's going to be a third coming of Christ. And that third coming of Christ is going to establish the, the resurrection of all the rest of the people that have died and are going to be brought to life. And then the dispensation of the fullness of times will come. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10, tells us about the fullness of times. And we'll talk about that one of these days down the road. I want you to understand this is a very, very quick process by which God is going to lay it out and had laid it out before. I get my notes from someplace. I do have them over here. I'm getting back to the completion of my message here real quickly. Uh, gentlemen, if you'll pass those out, I'd appreciate that. We're going to be passing out a sheet, two sides. This is not for us to go through this morning. It's for you to take home, enjoy. It has scripture verses. It has things that uh, may or may not be of help to you as you uh, think about it. And uh, hopefully those things will be of help to you. Getting back to my sermon here. The five dispensations that we're going to be talking about on that sheet are given there and the timeline related to it. God is in control is my whole thrust, my whole theme. Thank you for being patient. God is in control of the universe. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17 says, He, Jesus Christ, holds all things together. Do you realize the only reason that we are 
living today is because God is in control. The only reason that we are going to be finding that God's plan is going to be filled, fulfilled in the future is because God is in control and he's going to continue to be in control. And then also for you and me as believers in Jesus Christ that he takes everything that happens in our life and he turns it over for our good. And we have that, of course, in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's what God has done for us and was willing to do for us to take the things that we've messed up in life and somehow he brings it all together for you and me. I hope that you've uh, learned some things here and that it will be a blessing to you. If not, praise the Lord anyway. I won't, I'll quit my acting job and I'll uh, get back to being a preacher next Sunday. Uh, thanks for doing that. Let's uh, bow in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what God has done to us and for us in our lives. Lord, we thank you for being your creation. Thank you for the opportunity we have to live and to die for you. Father, we ask that you might help us to depend upon you in every situation of life, realizing that you are in control. Uh, Father, we have to give you control of our own lives. And maybe you're here this morning and God is not in control of your life. But you want him to be in control of your life. What you need to do is to submit to him. You need to surrender your will for his will that you might be able to do the will of God. Are you willing to surrender your will and your way to God's way? Heavenly Father, I pray that each person may consider that. May each person evaluate their heart and life. And Lord, may they be willing to give themselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to your honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.